Okay, if we could uh, uh, cue up the slides. So my name is Marco Mara, uh, and I'm from uh, the British Columbia Cancer Agency Genome Sciences Center. I'd like to thank uh, Elaine and Linda for the opportunity to address you today on uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, sequence-based RNA profiling. And so, um, in an in a apparently unusual move, uh, what I'd like to do is start the presentation uh, with the acknowledgments. And I'm not advancing the slides here, so maybe I can have some oh, assistance from the guys in the back. The advancer is not advancing. Yeah, I'm pressing the button. Very good. Oh, whoa, okay. That's number one. If we could go forward, number two. All right. Uh, so this slide is a, a very high-level overview of the organization. Uh, this slide is a different slide. This is hands-free, guys. We're in the matrix. Uh, so this slide is a high-level organization um, of TCGA, if you like. Uh, and I haven't uh, seen a depiction of this slide. Thank you. OK. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd throw it up there, uh, uh, basically for two reasons. One, to uh, emphasize um, the area that I'm going to talk to that's in the upper left of the slide. Uh, but also to point out that uh, TCGA, I think, is remarkable for, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons I think it's remarkable is the focus, the emphasis that it's brought uh, to uh, large-scale analyses of cancer. Uh, and I think all of you sitting in this room uh, are evidence that there's a, a very powerful and compelling attractive force to the availability of such data. Uh, so here's my acknowledgement slide. Uh, it's uh, one of the more important slides I'm going to show you today. Uh, and my reason for putting it right up front is to acknowledge and thank all the individuals that have provided slides and concepts uh, for this particular presentation. Uh, individuals from British Columbia uh, on the left uh, and collaborating sites on the right. Uh, I want to also apologize in advance if uh, I've butchered any of your slides or their interpretation uh, for those of you that have provided them. Uh, I am speaking on behalf today not only of uh, the group in BC, uh, but a larger group that includes uh, Chuck Peru and Neil Hayes at uh, UNC uh, and a large cohort of individuals at WashU with whom we've been working on uh, AML fairly intensively. So thanks to you all. Uh, and most importantly, uh, thanks to the patients, uh, uh, because without them, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have a project and we uh, wouldn't have a motivation. So uh, on to the business uh, of the discussion. Uh, so RNA-Seq um, is being done primarily uh, at uh, UNC uh, with some smaller contributions from ourselves, uh, and we in BC are primarily uh, generating uh, and to a more limited extent analyzing uh, microRNA sequencing data. Uh, and I've listed here just a, a few applications uh, for those data modalities. Uh, I think uh, some particularly exciting uh, opportunities exist around uh, novel analyses using these, these very sensitive measures. Uh, and uh, I think in particular the opportunity for the first time uh, exists to produce a map that wires together uh, the exons that are expressed in various malignancies and use this information uh, in novel ways. So we're excited to, uh, to see those kinds of analyses emerge. Uh, so there is a uh, large and growing cohort of RNA-seq data produced by the group at UNC, and thanks to Chuck Peru for this slide, uh, where he's showing uh, the availability of more than 1,500 uh, RNA-seq uh, lanes and samples uh, at the DCC. Uh, this is growing very rapidly. Uh, the other point to take away from this slide is the extent to which uh, these RNA-seq uh, data uh, can be used to define uh, cancer types and subtypes. Uh, it's a very uh, beautiful and striking uh, picture. 
along with the uh, evolving data sets uh, that you'll find at uh, the DCC and, and indeed elsewhere, are an evolving cohort of tools, and, and this slide is too small to read, and, and that's probably the point, uh, that there are uh, numerous tools that are available now uh, and uh, coming on board uh, for analyses of RNA-seq data, uh, both at the level of the entire gene, but also at the level of individual exons and exon-exon junctions. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to highlight uh, some examples uh, taken from two of the tools that uh, we've had uh, some focus on. Uh, that would be uh, Transibis, which is a, a de novo assembly tool for RNA-seq data, uh, and AlexaSeq, uh, which is used primarily for uh, exon level expression analysis. Uh, but before we go there, uh, I want to take the opportunity to, to talk about um, how technology changes uh, are, are going to mean that the amount and uh, hopefully the quality of the RNA-seq data uh, will increase and improve uh, over time. So this is a very old slide that shows uh, on the uh, bottom axis uh, read numbers uh, and on the y-axis the coverage of exons. This was done in a, uh, a colorectal cancer cell line. And the purpose of the slide is to simply show the trajectory of, of gene discovery. Uh, so there's an initial uh, rapid rise in the rate of gene discovery with increasing numbers of reads, uh, and then the, uh, the tail of the distribution indicates a relatively slow accumulation of, of uh, new exons, uh, but rather speaks to an increasing coverage of those exons. And so when we started with the AML data, if we were to plot the number of reads on this trajectory, uh, that's where we were. And to get to that point, about 125 million reads, required something like two lanes of information per case. Uh, with the evolution of uh, at least the Illumina sequencing platform, uh, this is about where we are today uh, for uh, TCGA RNA-seq data where uh, you're no longer at two lanes per sample, but two samples per lane, and uh, even at uh, multiplexing these samples, uh, we have an uh, increasing amount of data. So we expect the coverage of exons uh, to be incrementally increased as well. Okay, so I have enormous enthusiasm for the concept of, of these exon wiring maps, as I'm calling them. Um, this is, I think, a primary strength of RNA-seq data, the ability to a look at exon level expression and uh, also to look at uh, novel structures that emerge from assembly of the uh, RNA-seq data. Uh, and so uh, another uh, very dense slide uh, whose only real purpose is to make the case that uh, there are a large number of ways in which uh, transcripts can be altered during splicing and these alterations can uh, in turn lead to uh, effects on the, on the protein product. And so in theory, uh, one could believe that uh, positive selection uh, might be acting on many of these uh, mechanisms of splicing uh, to produce uh, effects giving cancer cells growth advantages. So it behooves us in, in the interest of comprehensive data generation uh, to start looking at this uh, in great detail. So if, if one considers uh, exon level expression across uh, a number of cell lines, um, one can see uh, on the top metal the, the uh, gene model of actin, excuse me, uh, and below it uh, one sees uh, a graph with a series of lines that represent levels uh, at exon and intron, if you like, uh, locations throughout that gene model, these are RNA-seq data, where we've plotted the expression of these features uh, across that gene model. And so here you can see some data from embryonic stem cell lines, uh, some breast cancer lines. Uh, and for this gene, uh, there's no action. Uh, all the expression appears on this, on this uh, plot to be uh, pretty equivalent. Uh, if you uh, look at uh, the expression in uh, drug-sensitive versus drug-resistant colon cancer cell lines, uh, you can find many examples where exons are, are dropped or retained. This is uh, one example uh, in which uh, there is a, a, an exon skipping event 
uh, and it shows up quite nicely in this Alexa-seq plot. Uh, so what you can see is uh, an exon missing um, in one of the samples uh, relative to the other, and that's indicated uh, on the gene model diagram uh, with the lines uh, indicating the splicing events that, uh, that this signifies. That's a relatively straightforward example. Uh, uh, more complex examples are, are easily found. Uh, here's a case where there's a whole lot of action uh, going on around exon 9 uh, in this particular gene, CA12, where there's exon skipping events uh, that actually skip two exons, some that skip one exon, so on and so forth. And these are predicted, for the most part, to have an influence on uh, the nature of the protein pro product. And then finally, one other example uh, which shows that, uh, in this case, the um, the expression of particular exons uh, is not necessarily reflected in the overall expression of the entire gene. Uh, so here's a gene level expression analysis uh, focused on TPM2 across two different subtypes of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And what you can see in, in these two subtypes, indicated in the different colors, uh, are approximately equivalent levels of overall gene expression. Uh, but if you look in more detail at the exon level, uh, what you can see uh, is uh, a subtype associated differential expression uh, in which an exon is either skipped or retained. Uh, so this uh, makes possible uh, some uh, analysis of uh, the details of the gene expression data at the level of these exons as opposed to the entire gene. Now, these kinds of concepts uh, in, in TCGA are being uh, expanded upon and refined. Um, and what I'm showing here is a, a, an elegant slide provided by uh, Chad Creighton uh, from uh, Baylor, in which he's, he's showing uh, expression levels across 629 differentially expressed exons uh, between two different stages of colorectal cancer, uh, and showing that for uh, uh, for these exons that there is a linkage between splicing patterns uh, and overall levels of gene expression. So this is where I think we are going. Uh, so one of the, the things that we focused on, uh, at least in our group, uh, pretty heavily is trying to find evidence of expressed structures that are not easily found uh, using alignment-based approaches. And so some of these structures can be quite complicated. Uh, and defy uh, identification by, solely by alignment. And so we use de novo assembly um, pretty heavily to, to try and find such things. Um, we use Transibus for this. There are other assembly tools uh, available, of course. Uh, and shown here is simply a, a cartoon uh, that emphasizes that uh, for this particular assembly approach, uh, we like to have paired end reads. Uh, we like to assemble those reads. Uh, using a, uh, an approach that you can read about in, in that reference. Uh, and uh, we like to find reads that map to that uh, novel structure uh, that actually span uh, the fusion gene breakpoint. Uh, we like then to uh, align these uh, contigs, we call them, uh, back to the genome uh, as a verification uh, of the fusion event. So this has been done uh, pretty exhaustively uh, we think for the AML RNA-seq data that we've been analyzing in collaboration with the folks at WashU. And shown here is simply a distribution of the, the different effusion events that have been detected using this assembly approach. Uh, Tim Lay showed this yesterday. Uh, and so we find uh, both the things that we expect to find in AML data, those are the, the known things in blue, uh, and at relatively low frequency, uh, a distribution of events that uh, uh, that tail off. Uh, that includes some genes that uh, we think uh, might be interesting to consider in the context of AML. Uh, I should make the point, now that I'm thinking about it, that the Transibus pipeline uh, that we offer is, is not automated from front to rear. There's a, a fair amount of manual interrogation that goes into this, uh, but as a consequence, uh, the verification rates uh, tend to be very high. So if people are interested, um, there are uh, individuals in this room, Gordon Robertson notably, who uh, can give you uh, clues and pointers as to the use of the, uh, the tool. Uh, the other thing that assembly offers uh, is the opportunity to detect uh, more complex things than, than uh, fusions between two genes. Uh, these would fall into two broad categories, for example, uh, 
partial tandem duplications and internal tandem duplications, and I won't take you through all the topography. Uh, the nucleating theme here is de novo assembly of the reads, uh, followed by alignment to, to aid in interpretation. Uh, and this too seems capable of finding known events uh, as well as uh, novel events uh, in AML. Uh, we have yet to verify the novel events for PTDs and ITDs. All right, uh, so in, as we transit along the, the shopping list of things that you can do with the data, uh, I'd like to spend some time uh, discussing expressed mutations. And so what I mean by that uh, are transcripts that uh, seem to be encoded from loci that are somatically mutated. Uh, so uh, there have been a, a number of groups uh, that have looked for mutations in RNA-seq data, and, and we're guilty of, uh, of this transgression. Um, as you might imagine, uh, there are a fairly uh, significant proportion of false negatives um, in uh, relying solely on RNA-seq for mutation identification. Uh, the flip side, though, is that if you find such things, uh, genes that contain a mutation that are expressed, you have uh, some knowledge of the context in which these mutations are expressed, and that can be useful helping to think about the function uh, that the mutations uh, might impart. Uh, I think a good example is that of EZH2, where uh, in the expressed uh, data for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, we see uh, over and over and over again uh, transcripts that uh, seem to be affected at a particular tyrosine residue within the set domain of this, uh, uh, this important methylator of histone H3K27. So they're there, uh, and you can find them, albeit with uh, uh, some uh, false negatives, uh, perhaps approaching 50%, depending on the sample that you're looking at. Uh, this is being, uh, I think, uh, aggressively uh, pursued at the moment and is the topic of some hot conversation. Uh, I remember a discussion with Gaddy earlier in the week where uh, it was being argued that uh, you can use RNA-seq for sequence verification of uh, candidate somatic mutations from uh, tumor normal genome pairs. And this nice slide uh, from Matt Wilkerson, uh, I think, makes the point quite well. Uh, and so if you look at the text, uh, what you'll see are some uh, statistics uh, based on medians. Uh, so if you, in lung, uh, you can find that about 66% or so of the candidate somatic mutations uh, have RNA-seq data that map to that locus. Of those, about three quarters uh, are detected. Uh, for an overall yield of about 50% uh, in the RNA-seq data. So one can imagine as these large projects go forward, um, one would use the RNA-seq data uh, in combination with the, the genome data uh, to verify the existence of mutations in a, in a perhaps rather rapid fashion. Uh, going even further, uh, Angela uh, in the Harvard group has been using RNA-seq data to uh, confirm, if you like, uh, fusions that are detected in low-pass coverage sequencing of colorectal tumors. And these just show some examples that, that Angela has provided uh, in which it's possible uh, to use this in a, in a mode that's confirmatory, not only at the level of the uh, individual bases, but uh, much larger uh, structural effects. Uh, and so we can imagine that, um, that this validation produces some uh, independent evidence of the existence of the fusion but also provides some information as to how the, the fusion is wired together uh, in the context of an express transcript. Okay, so covering a lot of ground, I apologize for that. Um, shifting gears yet again, uh, I want to have uh, the opportunity just, just very briefly to make a few comments on uh, microRNA sequencing. Uh, which is uh, our principal contribution at this moment to uh, TCGA. Uh, so there are now on the order of uh, 3,000 or so uh, microRNA-seq profiles uh, at the DCC, uh, representing uh, something like um, 18 different cancer types. Uh, and the diagram, the clustering diagram below, uh, simp simply shows uh, the tumor sites for which these are available and the ability to use these data to, to uh, correlate with um, uh, disease pathology. So uh, one of the, the main rationales uh, for us when we, we entered into this uh, was the opportunity to, to think about the interplay between messenger RNAs and microRNAs. Uh, that's uh, this uh, 
little diagram down here. And so we imagine that microRNAs can uh, play regulatory roles that act at various uh, cell biological levels. Uh, and so we were anxious to, to generate these data to enable analyses that would look at the correlation between uh, microRNA and messenger RNA sequences. I'm not going to talk about any of that. Um, you can speak to Gordon Robertson or Andy Chu, uh, who are both here, uh, that can tell you uh, the status of that. Uh, instead, I think uh, what I want to point out in, in my observation is that uh, in addition to having the potential to look at these regulatory relationships, uh, we think that we have some evidence that suggests that these poor old uh, star microRNA guys uh, sitting up there that have been relegated to the degradation bin uh, upstream of the gene regulatory process um, may not actually be uh, degraded in, in a way that prohibits uh, their function in a regulatory context. Uh, there are also, uh, as we're learning, uh, all sorts of interesting features about microRNAs revealed by the sequence, including uh, the addition of non-templated bases, uh, which can expand the target range of these things. So clearly this is a, a fairly rich resource that uh, I hope people out there are tapping into and analyzing aggressively. Uh, for AML, just as an example, uh, there were on the order of 190 libraries sequenced uh, with an average yield of about a million uh, mapped reads, uh, detecting between 270 to 400 odd uh, known microRNAs. Uh, not that many novel microRNAs uh, are, are found uh, using this depth of sequencing uh, and uh, the approaches that we are using to process. Uh, but even so, uh, what we have noticed is uh, a very interesting distribution of the so-called star strand versus uh, mature strand expression. And so uh, there's a, uh, a transcript up at the top, you see it there, uh, with the indications of, of uh, what will become uh, processed star and, and mature strand uh, microRNAs. Uh, if the star strand is indeed relegated to the bin, as it were, and, and chewed up in an upstream degradation, you wouldn't expect many of them to be around. Uh, and what we show here is the, uh, the ratio uh, from the microRNA sequencing of uh, star strand to uh, mature strand expression. And the box is around a case where the, the star strand uh, is expressed at about seven times that of, of the mature. And so clearly these are abundant and there are probably regulatory roles that uh, can be inferred uh, from these as well as uh, different targets uh, for their action. So again, uh, this is a... a an invitation, if you like, to get interested in this area and, and take it forward. Um, you can, of course, use the, the microRNA sequencing uh, for uh, clustering purposes. And so shown here on the right uh, is a microRNA uh, clustering experiment using the, the uh, AML microRNAs. And on the left, uh, RNA-seq clustering using the, uh, uh, the AML data. So these are the same cases. Uh, and I'd miss pointing out uh, areas in which uh, the, the uh, RNA-seq data agree with the microRNA data. That's uh, the top line, and in green for all of you that aren't challenged with color. Uh, so we see here that uh, for the uh, M3 subtype cases, the microRNA and, and messenger RNA clustering data uh, yield about the same result. Uh, so they're concordant in this respect. Uh, less concordance is seen in cases that have an NPM1 uh, insertion, and that's shown below, uh, where the uh, microRNAs seem to be quite sensitive uh, for such cases, uh, and the messenger RNAs less so. All right, so a quick tour uh, through some of the things that uh, you can use the data for. Now I want to go into an area that um, I think represents a, a forward direction uh, for TCGA. Uh, and this area really is uh, sense and antisense gene expression and the consequences or the, the potential regulatory consequences of expression, overlapping expression uh, in particular on the plus and minus strands. Uh, and so uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm, I'm showing here a cartoon of uh, sense and antisense genes and, and just for convention purposes, we'll call the top gene the sense gene. Uh, so uh, these transcripts overlap uh, and what this diagram says is that uh, when uh, the gene on the lower strand is ex expressed, uh, that there's a difference in splicing pattern, uh, frequency of splice transcripts uh, that is, is then found as depicted in, in the lower panel. Uh, so when expression of the lower guy is on 
uh, you tend to see uh, an increase in expression uh, in alpha-1. So there's, there's actually a, a few examples of this, but, but not loads and loads and loads uh, in the literature. Uh, so what might this do? Well, splicing, uh, perhaps, is an influence of this kind of expression. Uh, the other thing that uh, has been linked to this kind of expression is, uh, is silencing uh, through methylation, either of chromatin uh, or directly uh, onto DNA. Uh, so there's a linkage here that we can exploit in the context of a project like TCGA, where uh, cases have uh, both expression data and methylation data, as you heard from Peter Laird uh, earlier in this uh, meeting. Uh, a more comprehensive example of, uh, if you like, um, using uh, affymetrics, uh, exon arrays is shown here. Uh, what I'm showing is the correlated and anti-correlated expression of two exons for uh, the gene PARP9. Uh, those are in uh, blue or red, uh, compared to the expression of uh, an antisense gene, DTX3L, that's in black. And what you can see is when DTX3L goes up, um, the expression of one of the uh, exons uh, in PARP9 goes down, that's the red line. And so there's this anti-correlation effect. And this is seen uh, in a rather pleasing pattern across uh, many different tissues. And so one speculates that um, this kind of effect might be uh, general uh, for this particular gene. And if you look in uh, TCGA uh, affymetrics uh, exon data, you can see on the bottom panel uh, that there are uh, quite a significant number of genes with sense, anti-sense correlated uh, apparent splicing uh, going on. And so a deeper analysis then uh, is before us uh, to address the question as to what might the function of, of this expression be. Uh, so I think in, in order for TCGA to go there and go there hard, um, we should be considering the use of uh, strand-specific uh, RNA-seq. This is not something that we've done. Um, um, so strand-specific RNA-seq is a modification of the RNA-seq that allows uh, knowledge of the strands to which uh, the individual reads map. Uh, the method that, that uh, we're quite enamored with at the moment is uh, the one published originally in, in NAR in 2009. Uh, and uh, the bottom reference there is a uh, uh, rather detailed uh, evaluation of the performance of a number of uh, different protocols. Uh, so I encourage you, if you're interested, to, to have a look at these. And so what I'm showing uh, in the black track is RNA-seq data analyzed in a strand-insensitive way. So this is maybe what you would see if you didn't know about strandedness. Uh, you can see all the peaks where the reads are lining up across the gene models uh, on the lower part of the diagram. Uh, with strand-specific information, uh, which is shown in the, in the center, in the uh, orange and the red, uh, you can now start to attribute the expression of these individual exons to, to the annotations below. Uh, which gives you, I think, a uh, rather more detailed view of the pattern of expression of these, uh, these closely linked and even overlapping loci. So there's information here. Uh, you might be able to, to figure out uh, how the reads go if you, if you have good annotation, but there are cases where uh, some of the annotation isn't yet available, and that's one of the things I think this project is going to do. And so shown here on the top, again, is a strand-insensitive analysis. It shows... Uh, big peaks and little peaks, uh, but the only gene model available is the one at the bottom. Uh, and so if you resolve this into, into strand uh, sensitive analysis, uh, what you can see is the gene model at the bottom is represented by uh, the orange peaks and the big thing in the middle uh, is something else entirely. Uh, so this has uh, two uh, meanings, I think. Uh, one is that you could uh, misinterpret the expression of this gene uh, by lumping all the reads in together. Uh, the other might be that uh, you, you've discovered a, a novel and potentially differentially expressed uh, transcript in your analysis of cancer samples. This happens to be an encoding RNA. Okay, uh, so just wrapping up, uh, I'd like to emphasize uh, what I said right at the beginning of the talk, uh, which is uh, we are very pleased uh, to be part of this project. Uh, I think it's an amazing uh, union of intellectual energies uh, and Thank you all for, uh, for being interested enough to come to this meeting. It's fantastic. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the foresight and vision of uh, the funders, um, particularly uh, NCI and NHGRI. Uh, and of course, we are supported by the BC Cancer Foundation. So with that, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. And we have uh, 25 seconds for a question.
have a question. So. For the um, RNA-seq mutation confirmation, do you have to use a specific nucleotide as the uh, verification, or are you looking at the whole gene for the... Uh, so, so when, so when we're when we're verifying uh, the existence of mutations, I mean, I suppose different folks uh, do it rather differently. Um, in the examples that I showed, uh, what we typically do is we match the RNA seq data against the genome data, and if the uh, if the two are in accordance uh, at a particular locus, then we would argue that that that's a, a verification result. Um, so it, it, it follows uh, on um, the nature of the actual mutation in, in the DNA. Because for using the RNA-seq for screening purposes, the false positive rate seems to be much higher if you're looking at samples that don't have the known mutation, but you're suspecting it in either an exon or somewhere along the chain. If you don't have a, a, uh, a match normal sample and you find something in the RNA-seq data, uh, uh, then uh, you're going to have to concoct a rationale that, that doesn't involve uh, somatic mutation, that's for sure. So you need some uh, source of normal if you want to claim it's a somatic event. One of the things that uh, we have, uh, I think, used the RNA-seq data for fairly successfully is looking for evidence of recurrent expressed mutations. And in the absence of normal, uh, this doesn't prove that that recurrent event um, is a somatic mutation because it could be a, a polymorphism, for example. Uh, but that does focus our attention on the things that we would take forward through to validation and tumor normal. There's a lot of uh, mutational noise in the RNA-seq data alone, so you have to be careful how you use it. Yeah, because I, I, from our experience, it seems that the false positive rate is much higher than, than what seems to be presented. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. All of these false positive uh, issues are related to the, the exact algorithm. Uh, that you employ and, and the deductive process that you employ, but there are many more false positives if using RNA-seq solely for mutation detection is on the agenda. Yeah, you gotta be careful. And I think with that, um, I'm happy to, to talk to you later, but I wanna keep the, uh, the session moving forward here.